So let me give you a brief history of artificial intelligence. And I got to admit that this was how uh, I used ChatGPT to help me with this. And I kind of condensed what they gave me. The, the history of artificial intelligence really dates back to a pioneering computer scientist, one of the people who built the first computer. His name was Alan Turing. He was really important during World War II. And he, he proposed this idea called the Turing test. And he said that when a machine can exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human, that is the definition of artificial intelligence. And there was this test where essentially a chatbot was set up and the responses were either human generated or computer generated and people were asked, can you tell if that's a human or a robot? So that's the Turing test. It's like the intellectual framework uh, and a way to define what artificial intelligence means. The term artificial intelligence didn't come actually until six years later at a time uh, at a, a gathering of intellectuals called the Dartmouth Conference. By the way, a lot of the heroes of AI are nerdy researchers. And uh, you're gonna actually meet kind of our resident nerd, Jeff Cooper, uh, coming up soon. He's really the kind of guy who gets into the nuts and bolts of it. And those are the guys who are, many of the, these are PhDs and researchers employed by Google, employed by Facebook, employed by Stanford, who are building these tools. In 2011, IBM Watson defeats two human champions on Jeopardy. In 2016, AlphaGo, which was developed by Google, defeats the world champion at the board game Go, one of the most complex board games in the world. And then in 2022, ChatGPT 3.5 is released and all hell breaks loose. That was in November. And I wanted to give my partner, Nicole, a chance to talk about kind of the modern history of AI. Uh, and then uh, how it led up to this moment. Thank you. Um, so most, a lot of people know what Grammarly is. It checks your spelling and now it even will give you suggestions of different sentences, how you could rewrite something. And Grammarly has been learning since 2009. It's been learning the words people commonly mistype. It's been learning sentence structure. It's been learning if you've been subscribed for a very long time to what your voice is like when you're writing. And um, a lot of organizations that I work with have Grammarly for all their employees so they can just write better emails even. Um, and then 2015, Monkey Learn came around and Monkey Learn was a plugin that could take in information and parse it out to what is valuable for you. And it would learn more and more based on feedback and you would have to give it a lot of feedback. So if I have a list, I had a list of press queries that came from Haro, help a reporter out. You could feed it into Monkey Learn and tell Monkey Learn to only give you the press queries that had certain keywords in it, and then it would do that. But it was a pretty manual and clunky process, um, which we have an evolution for that one currently that's much more sophisticated. Um, in 2019, we started using Otter. And Otter and Firefly and some of the others now, they will follow you around on all your Zoom meetings and take notes for you. Otter today does screenshots and you can summarize your notes, but you can, so we used it for podcast transcripts and show notes, and then we put that to a blog post. Um, and then, and that's, that saved us a lot of time in processing transcripts. In 2020, chatbots started taking over. So when you go to a website, you often encounter a chatbot for your first interaction with someone's customer service. And, and if anybody's ever popped up a chatbot, you know you had to program what the answers could possibly be for all of the questions that someone could come and have. And now it's super smart. You can integrate chat GPT and you can have it learn what the questions are if you have a big database of them and smartly produce much better prompts and you don't have to program at all. It just learns from your information. Um, in 2021, we started using um, this AI for emotionality 
And um, emotionality is a program where you go in, you take a quiz, you learn what your top emotional need is, and you can subscribe to a text message service and emails, and you'll start to get text messages that support you and your emotional needs. And on the back end, the AI is learning what kind of content you like to interact with. If you like videos or images, if you like memes, or if you like more of the text or text long lessons, and it'll serve up more of that information. So it's learning you and giving, giving your preferences back to you. Um, Jasper AI was called Jarvis. It came out in 2021. And I'd say for me, that was kind of my AI aha. Um, because Jasper started saving us time every day in writing the content that we have to write. As a marketing agency, you have to write, you have to write so much content. You have to write the website content. And as everybody has been posting in here, most people's pain comes in writing content and designing brochures. It looks like everybody's having a hard time or, you know, spending time on website content. Well, Jasper has all these different templates and you can go in and use them and get a lot of good content um, really quickly. So I'd say it doubled our output in the first month and probably quadrupled our output within about three months, like four to five times our output. Um, and then in Gmail, Gmail started giving email prompts. So when you're writing your emails in Gmail, it finishes your sentences for you because it's been learning this whole time too, since they started implementing their AI on the background. And so now it knows how you write and the things that you might say next. And I, I personally love that, that it, you know, it just makes the email writing faster. And then Jasper also plugs into Gmail. So if I wanted to, Jasper will continue it even farther than Gmail will. And I can write emails using Jasper. Um, there's a little poll that just popped up. So um, let us know if you've used an AI tool and um, how many times you've used ChatGPT in the past week. And also, um, which you've used at least once in a list of tools, and if you have found that you've saved money using AI tools. For us, it's about saving time and making more money. Um, and then in 2022, we started using Robotic Marketer, which does marketing strategies. And you know, there's page after page of input. Um, it still it took us from eight weeks to create a marketing strategy before Robotic Marketer down to about two weeks now. And so it saved us a ton of time. Again, it didn't necessarily make us money on that one, but it did save us time and money. And Canva, which a lot of people use for graphics, has AI apps in there. And you can ask it to make images specifically for you. And it's kind of fun. It's not perfect, but it's fun to play with. Mid Journey does amazing photo realistic images now. Um, and then, of course, ChatGPT came along and um, made it really easy for everybody to use AI. And now in 2023, there are new AI tools coming out every single day. There's a website called There's an AI for that. And they've got probably a couple thousand listed at least on the website. And so you can search by category on what kind of processes you're trying to shortcut with AI. And there is probably an AI for that. And if not, I can guarantee you somebody's working on it. And probably several people are. So I think it's a time where like uh, we want to, for me, I want to keep things simple and accessible so that everybody in here can learn how to use AI and you don't feel overwhelmed by it. And it it's something that will be able to save you time every day if you just keep your little tab open with AI um, and start to use it on a regular basis. Uh, can we go to the next yeah, great job. Yeah, so what we're really seeing, and thank you very much, Nicole, we'll be hearing from you in a sec again, is what we're really seeing is the technology adoption curve. We just jumped the chasm. 
I really mark November 30th when ChatGPT was released as the moment when we came to the other side of the chasm from early adopters like Nicole, who's been doing this for eight years, to regular Joes like me who are sitting in my uh, you know, bed uh, playing with ChatGPT. ChatGPT was just this very accessible kind of eye-popping tool that a lot of us uh, have been using. So um, looking right now at the poll, about two thirds of you have participated. I would invite those of you who haven't participated uh, to jump in. We're gonna close it here in a second. But about one in four of you have never used ChatGPT. Um, over, that's actually pretty good. Across the adult US population, approximately 50% of adults in the US have used ChatGPT in the previous week. Now, on one hand, that's like only 50. On the other hand, it's a tool that's only been around for a couple of months. It is the fastest adoption of a new technology in the history of mankind. The second fastest adoption was Instagram. Mm -hmm. And what they were able to accomplish in, in four months, it took Instagram four years. So this is literally orders of magnitude faster adoption than anything we've ever seen ever. Faster than the internet, faster than Facebook, faster than Instagram, faster than anything. And it is a product of the ease of the tool. Uh, and it also explains why it kind of flares out and sometimes uh, gets overburdened because just not only are more people using it, but they're using it more often. So the, the volume of usage is giant. Now, what is the implication of that? Developed countries, people with money and resources, they're going to have more advantages with AI because of the massive computing power required to run it. And so there's an inherent bias that we'll be talking about in the fact that only really wealthy companies, countries, and people have access to these tools. We happen to live in the richest country in the world, and so we do have access to these tools. But even for us, unless you pay, you get throttled sometimes.